Hello everyone and welcome to another Stat 437 lecture video. In today's video we are actually going to be fitting accelerated failure time models using real data inside of R. So as I've been mentioning the accelerated failure time models are the natural regression models that sort of come out of this whole location scale parameterization. And in fact the last time we were in R in these lectures we were fitting models to exponential data and we were using the servreg package. Now, as I mentioned there, and as we sort of motivated at the end of that lecture, the servreg package is actually fitting accelerated failure time models. It's a little bit more broad than that. It can fit sort of other classes of models as well, but for our purpose, it fits accelerated failure time models. And so because of that, we're sort of already familiar with uh, the sort of basic formulation of how we're going to go about fitting these models. But what I want to do today is fit uh, several of them. You know, we can do some model selection. Uh, we can talk about doing model testing, uh, hypothesis testing, answering questions, that type of thing. Now, all of this is, you know, probably starting to get somewhat repetitive. And the reason for that is that ultimately this whole course has been formulated around the idea of using regression models to fit different types of data. Right, and so the process has been quite similar. You know, we have some sort of uh, fitting technique. We specify our model. We get out some set of coefficients or model parameters. We can do hypothesis tests. We can do inference. We can answer questions that are scientifically relevant, whatever else. And so I'm hoping that all of this has become uh, sort of second nature to you at this point. But what I'll do today is sort of quickly walk you through how we can go about doing this within the context of accelerated failure time models. So I'll open up R here and we can start. And so because we are um, working off of the work that we did last time, I'm going to just load in the survival library again. We'll read in that customer churn data and we're gonna work on the exact same example because we sort of left it on that cliffhanger. And uh, I've also added back this event indicator here. Now, the other thing that I wanna do quickly and there's going to be a reason for this that you'll see in a minute is I actually want to drop the third column in our data so if i take a look at the churn uh, data frame here you can see the third column is our censored column and the reason that i want to drop this is because we have this event column um, we're going to run into some some questionable issues if we just start trying to fit our models and the censored indicator ends up coming in because obviously the censored indicator exactly predicts the event indicator and so um, you know, we'll drop, we'll drop the censored indicator here. Okay. And the other thing that I want to do to clean this up a little bit, and you don't technically have to do this, but I just think that it's uh, both, it's a nice thing to have seen in R at some point, but also it makes uh, interpretation slightly better is to re-level a couple of the factors. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the phone service uh, is going to be a re-leveled version of the phone service. And one of the things that re-level is going to do is just allow you to specify a new reference level. And the reference level, level I'm going to set to no. And all that's going to do um, is have this being treated as a uh, uh, the base class when you fit the model with it. Now, what, I, uh, what I'm getting here on this uh, error is that there's a, it needs to be only for factor variables. And so if I just take a brief look at our churn uh, data frame here for a second, you can see that it's no longer a, um, a factor variable, it's actually a character variable. And this is true with all of these. Now, oftentimes I like using character variables instead of factor variables, but what I'm going to do instead is come in here and specify strings as factors in the load in to be true. Doing this, if we now view the churn uh, data frame here, you can see that these are all factor variables now instead of character variables. So just a, another little R tidbit there, but we're going to drop the censored indicator. Um, and then I can come in here and relevel the phone service. And that uh, is working out as it uh, should be. And what this is going to do, it's going to make the base class in our model be no, so that we get a coefficient for yes, uh, rather than flipping it around. Uh, we can do the same thing with the internet service. Now, again, this is not necessary, but um, re-leveling your variables can be quite a nice uh, way of making your model more easy to interpret for the questions that you might actually uh, be of predominant interest to you. Okay, so now that we've uh, sort of 
cleaned up our data a little bit, we can start fitting a few different models. And so what I basically want to do is I want to fit a different model for each of the four distributions that we've mostly been talking about with respect to survival data. So that's the exponential, the Weibull, the log normal, and the log logistic. Okay, so each of these is going to be the call to serve reg. And with serve reg, we do a serve, which takes the time in the event. And um, for now, I'm going to use this shorthand where I just include a period on the other side of the formula. And what that's going to do is it's going to include all of the factors in our data frame, except for the time and the event, right? So anything that's not on this side is going to be included, right? And the reason for this is that, uh, you know, if we take a view of churn, we're going to actually sort of see that there are a lot of different columns. And so if I just want to fit sort of the base main effects model, then it's easier just to do it that way instead of typing out the uh, total number of columns. Now, the only thing that I'm going to point out as well, is so um, if we take a look, the ID column is presently going to be included, and that's going to be a problem for us because that's going to be fitting a separate regression model for every individual. So I want to make sure I drop the ID, but I don't want to get rid of it entirely. And same thing with this total charges uh, variable, right? So in theory, you could include the total charges in your model. I have some level of uh, skepticism of doing that. The only reason is that these total charges are obviously scaling very closely with this time variable, right? And so an individual is going to have, uh, roughly speaking, the monthly charges, uh, the total time is roughly speaking going to be total charges divided by monthly charges. Not exactly because people's plans could change over time, but that's more or less going to be the case. And that's not a very interesting relationship for us to learn, right? If you're trying to predict how long is a customer going to stay, using total charges to predict that isn't necessarily the most interesting, but the rest of these are all uh, valid. And so what I'm going to do here is when I come in to uh, specify what data I'm going to use, I'm going to say, I want the churn uh, data frame, but I'm going to select minus C13. And what this is going to do is it's going to exclude the first and third column from the data set there. And I'll come in and specify the dist to be exponential. And I'll sort of uh, clean this up a little bit here, right? And we can fit that and we fit our exponential model. And then I'm just going to come in and copy and paste this down a few more times. And we'll try it with the other distributions, right? So uh, fit the exact same model, except instead of exponential, we can fit it to the Weibull. Uh, instead of exponential, we can fit it to the log normal. And so again, note that you only need to specify as many characters of the distribution to get a, a uniquely specified distribution. But all of this is in the documentation if you're unfamiliar with what I'm doing here. But so now we have our Weibull, our log normal, and our log logistic model, right? And so we can take a peek and there's going to be a couple of things to note. So let's just take a look at the exponential model, right? And we'll make this as large as you can. And so you can see we have our coefficients table here. Right, and we have a lot of coefficients, the standard errors and the p-values and, and so forth. Now, what I would point out is that we actually get NAs for a handful of these different uh, factors. And if you take a peek, all of them sort of have something in common, right, for which factor levels we're getting NAs for. And it's interesting if you want to try and think about why we're getting NAs there, right? Um, so the problem is, is that if a person has no phone service, well, we already actually have a uh, a factor that represents the person not having phone service, which is phone service no, right? And the same thing would have happened had we had uh, phone service uh, yes being the baseline class, then instead of it being no phone service being NAs, then we would have had uh, yes being NAs, right? And so the problem here is that essentially the model we're trying to specify means that we can't estimate all of these parameters. Now, that's not actually a problem. That's just coming in because we sort of used this uh, lazy notation here. Right? And if we had gone in and specified and thought about it, we would have said, okay, we can't estimate the uh, main effect of there being uh, a person with no phone service if we already have uh, an effect that is exactly the same. Right, So they're one-to-one -one correlated with each other. So for now, we're just going to ignore the fact that the NAs are there. The easy way to get around this would be to take a peek at all of those and just simply drop them from your models. So we wouldn't include those factor levels in our models, or you could include them um, you can include the streaming TV term here intersecting with uh, the phone service so that uh, the people with no phone service just get sort of a single parameter estimated and then uh, otherwise they're, they're intersecting there. But all of that would have taken a lot longer to specify in the formula and so we'll just do it this way and just note that's why we're getting some NAs there. 
right? So we can just do the summary as we as we uh, would normally think to, and of course we could do the same with all of these different models, right? And um, so maybe maybe what we want to do is let's just take a look at uh, the head of the coefficients for each of these models, okay? And so um, maybe what I will do is I will come in here and I will unname these just to make them sort of easier to see in the console here, okay? And if I do this for each of my different models, we have four of them, right? We can do the Weibull model, the log normal model, and the log linear or the log logistic model. Sorry. We run these four, and we can just sort of try and take a peek at them, right? And so we can see we're getting some variation in the intercept estimate. The intercept would be the first one. So uh, for both the exponential and the Weibull, well, those are uh, sort of about 4.6 ish. 4.6, 4.7, the log normal and the log logistic fit quite a bit differently. And we could go through and do the same thing, right? And so what we're seeing is that the exponential and the Weibull uh, have quite a similar fit to the data, right? Some some differences, but they're quite a bit different uh, for the most part to uh, the log normal and the log logistic, right? Same uh, signs of, of the effects, but a different scale that we're operating on, essentially. And so there's this question that is sort of natural to ask, which is about how we could go about selecting between these models, right? And there's several ways you could do this. Uh, the easiest or, or sort of the most natural in my mind would be just to look at the AIC of them, right? And so if we do the AIC of the model uh, of each of these models, right? So, oh, there's not model one, it's just model, sorry. Uh, log normal model log logistic, and we run that, you see we get an AIC output for each of these, and we're looking for the minimal AIC, right? And so we can see the exponential actually has uh, uh, one one additional or one fewer uh, parameter that it needed to fit. And so uh, it's going to have slightly less penalty term, but it turns out that the log normal is actually sort of the best fit to the data. Now, whether these are really different from one another, that's, you know, would be uh, better for you to judge based on the subject matter expertise. But for now, what we'll say is that uh, based on the AIC, the log normal appears to be our preferred model. And so we can work with that. Now, one thing that I would also point out is we've talked a lot about how the Weibull distribution, if you force the scale parameter to be one, you get the exponential distribution. And what that means is that the uh, exponential distribution is nested within the Weibull distribution, okay? And so what we could do is we could actually run an ANOVA call on the uh, model Weibull and the model exponential. And what this is testing is whether the exponential is appropriate relative to the Weibull. So if the Weibull is our baseline starting point, we can say, can we simplify this to the exponential model by running this hypothesis test here? And uh, obviously outputs a quite a long term here, but what we're really looking at is this p-value, and so p-value is much less than 0.05, and so we would reject the null hypothesis, and we'd say no, the Weibull is actually a better fit to the data compared to the exponential, right, which also checks out with our AIC criteria here, um, the exponential 17907, the Weibull is uh, quite a lot smaller than that, but that does give you some sense, right, uh, the difference here is about, what's that, 16, 16 or so, 16 or 17 between uh, the Weibull and the exponential. And then we're looking at uh, like almost 200, not quite, but uh, 180, something like that, for the uh, difference between the Weibull and the log normal, which should suggest that the log normal is quite a bit better as a fit to the data. All right. Now, what does it really mean for us to say that we're dealing with a log normal uh, distribution here? Well, if you think about what model we just fit for these uh, data, right? Well, what we're saying is that we have uh, sort of log t, which is equal to y, and then in the case of the log normal, we've said that y should then be a normally distributed variable. And so we'd have mu plus uh, e, where e is distributed as a normal zero sigma squared, right? And so what this means is that if you were to think about mu as our predictions, right, then the residuals uh, so you take y minus mu, those should be approximately normally distributed, okay? And so we could we could try and fit those residuals, right? And how would we get them? Well, I'll just find a variable here called my resid. And the y is given by the log of your churn time, right? And the uh, log normal, we can actually grab what are called the linear predictors. 
right? And that's this eta term that we're talking about, the X transpose beta. And this is just going to be the linear predictors for every uh, observation in the model. And so what we have here is uh, Y minus our estimated uh, mu, which is giving us an estimate for E, right? And so the idea is that if uh, the model is correct, then my residuals should be approximately normally distributed. And we could do a whole residual analysis. I'll just quickly throw up a, a QQ norm here to check the uh, normality of this. And then, you know, we could overline the QQ line. And my thinking on this is that it's probably not normally distributed, right? This, this appears to be too heavily tailed to be uh, a normal distribution, right? But it, it does uh, appear to be okay, okay enough for us to deal with it for now at least. But my guess would be that it's actually probably uh, sort of a more a more heavy-tailed distribution that we'd be dealing with, right? Um, so the log normal is probably not your best bet, but it also does not look so bad. It's not like there's a very clear skew or bias or um, that kind of thing. So we'll keep going with the log normal, but that would be roughly how you could check, is this an appropriate parametric distribution? Okay, so then what we can do is, you know, we've sort of done some model checking. We've uh, uh, done some model selection. We saw how we could test between different types of models if, if certain ones are appropriate or not. So I guess the last thing that we could talk about now is uh, sort of how do we go about using this to answer questions that might be of interest to us? So I have a, a few questions as I've uh, become you know, accustomed to doing. So uh, the first one would be how does... Uh, Survival time compare between an individual with paperless billing compared to those who receive a paper bill. Okay, and so if I just take a quick look at the summary of uh, the model here, and just scroll up to where these coefficients are, you can see that we have this uh, paperless yes uh, value, right? And I believe that this is actually the eighth uh, coefficient of the model. So if I go model one log normal uh, eight. I believe that this, oh, not model one, sorry, model, log normal. Yeah, okay, so there's our paperless billing. And so this is essentially, the question is, how does survival time com compare between uh, these individuals, all right? And so you can think about this, we've talked about this as uh, sort of an acceleration of uh, failure time, right? And so one way that you might think about this is thinking about sort of the ratio of the, of the uh, survivor time for instance. Um, so if you are someone who has paperless billing, so that this, this coefficient is included, versus someone who does not have paperless billing, um, but otherwise everything else is sort of identical, right? Well, then you would be looking at um, your eta value as having changed by e to the negative point uh, 1584355, right? Um, and on the multiplicative scale. Right. So uh, I guess put differently, if you're thinking about sort of taking a ratio between someone who has paperless divided by someone who has a non paperless, so papered. Uh, and in the top, we're looking at the uh, say the time. Right. And then we do the time down in the bottom here. Then what you're expecting to see is that up here or what's going to be left when you take this ratio is going to be E to this power of this uh, coefficient right here, right? And so we could take a look at what is the exponent here. And if we plug it in, what we're saying is that that's, uh, you know, about 0.85. And so uh, on average, then, if you do a paperless billing, you have about uh, 0.85 times uh, rate of, of survival. The amount of length of time that you would expect to survive is about 0.85 times by your baseline. That's the effect on it, at least. Okay. Now, it is also worth noting, if we take a look uh, quickly at, say, the model one uh, log normal, we can take a look at the or sort of the summary. And I believe that coefficients should be one of these uh, t table, maybe. So I was making the same mistake that I've been making this whole time. It's not model one, it is just model but model coefficients works. And if I take the, uh, eight throw here, that seems uh, to be strange, but, oh, okay, there we go. It's uh, just doesn't have their p-value associated with it. My bad. 
Um, so this has slightly different formatting, but I can just scroll up and grab this. You can see the paperless uh, right here is the column of the p-value, right? And so it's a 0.01 p-value. So it does appear to be a significant uh, effect, right? But you could have tested that yourself. Um, yeah, okay. So moving on to the next question. Uh, this one's about a 95% confidence interval for the impact of whether the individual has a partner or not, okay? And so here, the idea is that we would be looking at uh, coefficient number 11 from this model, right? So that's partner, yes. You can see that we have the estimated value there. Um, now, so this is going to be sort of the, the point estimate would be taking the exponential of this, right? And we could grab the standard error for this as well. And that's going to be the square root of the diagonal. And we can just grab the uh, variance here. And then which uh, element we would want is the 11th element, right? And so that's going to be our standard error. And then we could get the upper and the lower bounds on this, right? So if we take this to be our estimate, then our 95% confidence interval is going to be, uh, well, actually, we don't want to do it this way, right? Because what we want to do is we want to apply the transformation, the exponential transformation to the whole interval. So we'd subtract off the Q norm, 0 0.975 times by the standard error, and that will give us a lower bound. And then if we do the same thing, except we add on that piece, that's going to give us uh, an upper bounded. So that sort of gives you the, the range um, uh, of the interval that we're looking at here. Okay. Now, the last question that I had been asking is uh, whether or not the streaming behavior impacts the rate at which a customer churns. So when I'm saying streaming behavior, if I just scroll over here, this is probably easier than looking at the coefficients table directly. You can see that there are these two columns here at the end, which are the streaming TV and the streaming movies. Okay, And uh, the idea is whether or not we can drop these two different streaming services uh, in our model without sort of losing any amount of predictive power. And so what could we do for that? Well, we could specify, say, model two, and we can use the update command, right? So we can update model.logn. And what I'm going to do for the update, based on the way that we had uh, specified that, is if instead of just dropping neg or, uh, 1 and 3, if I also drop 19 and 20, they are the 19th and 20th column, um, then if I fit this model, if I take a look at the model 2, you can see that otherwise it's quite similar, except down here at the bottom, we don't actually have any of those streaming values. All right? And so... Um, we could then take model two. Model two is nested within our first model. And so we could do uh, an ANOVA, right? We can specify the ANOVA, uh, where we're gonna go model log normal, model two, we run this, and you can see the p-value is 0.99. There is no difference between dropping these two. So these, whether or not a person pays for streaming TV and streaming movies tells you nothing about whether they churn. And so maybe that's good to know uh, as, as the business there. Right, so I suppose the last thing that I would want to do here, um, which I didn't have uh, explicitly in, in the code that's going to be uploaded on, on the website, but maybe I'll just walk through in a little bit more detail the output of this uh, model, and specifically for the Weibull distribution here, because the Weibull is going to end up being very commonly used, right? So we've been looking at the uh, coefficients table, right? And if again, if we're thinking about what is happening when we have the uh, the location scale family, right? We're thinking about y as equaling sort of the log row plus w, right? But w, what we had actually seen before, is equal to, uh, in the case of the Weibull, 1 over kappa times by w, right? And so this 1 over kappa is sort of giving us our error variance term. And then, uh, for instance, if kappa equals 1, then we're in an exponential distribution. And so there's this, uh, there's some output in, in this table that's worth uh, taking a look at, right? So we have our, um, we have uh, the log scale parameter and the scale parameter given to us here. Sorry, so the, uh, the output that I was looking at, actually, I was reading off of the uh, test statistic rather than the actual statistic. And so if I look at my summary for my model, my log normal model again, you can see that we had 
or sorry, I was looking at the Weibull model, wasn't I? It's not that it changes much, but try to be consistent here. So I had said the log scale was 4.24 and the scale was 1.08. And those two values do not actually correspond correctly. The log scale is this point uh, 0.0802, right? And so that's the value. And then uh, I was actually reading off the Z score. Hopefully that's less confusing when you're looking at the output on yours. My text size is quite large because of uh, trying to pick it up on the video. But what I should point out is that this is the scale parameter from our location scale uh, family distribution, right? And so you can see the scale is a 1.808. And if I take in the exponential of this, you can see I get the same uh, 1.08 there. The difference being that we can also test uh, sort of the significance of the, of the log scale. All right, and um, this is essentially a test of uh, is the value, uh, can this be simplified down to an exponential model, right? Because the scale is this kappa parameter, the kappa gives us um, whether it's exponential or not, right? And so you can get sort of scale becoming the, uh, at least part of how you would get to the variance of your error distribution. Now, in order to understand fully how you're gonna have to get to the error distribution, you're going to have to take a look at the different parameterizations, right? So. Uh, what is the variance of that error term? It's going to differ depending on the different distributions that you have. But if I take a look, for instance, at the summary of uh, my model, my log normal, you can see that the uh, the log scale here uh, is given by uh, where we would scroll up and not make the same mistake. Log scale is this 0.43. If you exponentiate it, you get this 1.54. Well, that's essentially our estimate of sigma. Right, and so then we could square that and get our variance estimate for the error bounds. Right, so and then um, the other piece would be all of our uh, likelihood and log likelihood is available down here, and we can read those off and we can compute likelihood ratio tests in the same way. Though I tend to do those with ANOVA in actual practice because uh, the ANOVA uh, function in R sort of works a little bit better for me. So hopefully that was all clear. I'm sorry for that confusion at the end where I was. Uh, mistaking the scale and the log scale, but hopefully that makes makes some sense. And hopefully you feel fairly comfortable reading off uh, the results of these uh, regressions. I would I would encourage you to play around a little bit more with these data specifically, and you know try to fit a few different models. Try to see you know test uh, hypotheses. Try to understand. Make sure you understand how the impact on the baseline time uh, works based on the different uh, variates that you're including, whatever else the case may be. As always. These data, these code are all posted on the course website. If you have any questions at all for me, please let me know. And otherwise I will see you all in the next lecture video.